Okay. One thing I'm so interested in, and we talked a little bit about this before, but you're such a rare person in medicine still, you know, cause you straddle this East and West. Can you just talk about your, how you came to be in OBGYN and Ayurvedic? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, ultimately it's very simple. I'm just very curious. That's really ultimately all it is. And, and I, and honestly, I think that what, that is what makes a good doctor. Mm-hmm. You've, you've got to remain curious and, and open. And um, I feel like that's maybe given lip service in conventional medicine, but I don't, don't think it's baked into the system. Okay. I don't think it really is. And I think that's a problem. So that probably drove me more into it. So I, you know, like everybody's motivation for going into their career. I mean, that was a complicated long-term thing, right? Like my dad's a doctor. So that definitely influenced me. Um, I was always really interested in people and um, interested in their stories and interested in helping. And that always was something that I felt motivated by. And so ultimately I, I landed in medical school. I did not go straight to medical school. I didn't do pre-med as a, as a undergrad. And I think that also influenced me greatly because I wasn't, you know, in this country, the way you go to medicine generally is you are, you choose some kind of a pre-med major in college and you're really siloed from the beginning. Right. And that's a big problem too, because then you're not getting all the critical thinking stuff. You're, you're getting a lot of science. Uh, and maybe it's changed, but I don't think the requirements have changed very much since I applied to medical school 25 years ago or 30 years ago. Yeah. So I ended up being, I majored in social psychology and art history. Like, I, you know, I, I was really involved in creative stuff and, and, and I did tons and tons of writing. I had, I actually, I just, uh, my mom passed away and we, we cleaned out her house. I found my, my honors, my thesis. I had to, I had to write a thesis, a book. Right. right. Wow. I had to do that. Yeah. You know, that was a for graduating yeah. and I went to a liberal arts college that was like a, that was the way you did it there yeah. and then I was out in the world for four years and you know because I had like a bachelor's in like this total liberal arts thing in the 80s and I wasn't didn't want to be a consultant or go to Wall Street like you know half my friends um I had a hard time getting a job yeah. <laughs> frankly <laughs> and um and I ended up in psychiatric child care wow <laughs> yeah don't even ask it was brutal <laughs> it was I learned a lot I learned a lot about like the system, (laughs) Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, um, dysfunction. I mean, dysfunction isn't even, you know, these were kids coming from very, very disrupted, abused in order to end up in the system, it's gotta be bad. And so all these things built together. Right. And then I was like, you know, the person in charge in this meeting is the doctor, (laughs) to be honest. And these other people, um, are doing a lot of good work, but like you, there's only a certain amount you can do here. And I thought, <clears throat> I'm going to revisit medicine. I had to go back to school, do all my pre-med requirements. Wow. And then I got introduced to the true pre-med world. And I was like, wow, okay, these people are like, eh, eh. so, right. but I was at that point doing all the things to get into med school. I worked at the Haight-Ashbury Free Clinic, <laughs> I was, uh, right? Which was actually is the oldest freestanding free clinic in North America. A guy here interviewed me at Harvard, tried to correct me. I was like, stop it, sir. Like, stop. That's not true. It was, you know, the Mecca of hippiedom, right? It was when they started it in the 60s and 70s. And actually at the time, a patient there um, is probably one of the most famous trans activists um, of her time. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to HIPAA violate, but I didn't realize she was a poet, super famous. You can figure it out now. Um, And I didn't realize who she was until later. And then I was like, oh my God, (laughs) like that was the, it was amazing. I found, I saw my first cervix there, people, right? Like I have one, when would I've seen it? Yeah. (laughs) And, and, you know, um, and people were really generous. It was like really idealistic medicine. And that was in my heart. I was like, this is my thing. This is my jam. Went to medical school, came back to LA, which is where my hometown and I was at County USC, which is now called something else, Keck or something, right? USC, big, one of the biggest county hospitals on the planet. Every kind of person, every kind of doctor, every kind of human, every kind of illness, a lot of really poor people, a lot of really poor people, last stop. And super, the patients were super generous again and very spiritual and very open about it. Okay. There's a reason for this story. And would tell me you're doing God's work, your God is working through you. And I was like, this is helping you feel healed. 
but this is real. There's some other energy going on here. This is not just about, I drew your blood. I rounded on you. We talked about your numbers. This is, this is the plan of care. Like there's some other thing going on here that I cannot explain and I don't need to explain, but it's happening. And it's an exchange of energy. It's, it's faith. I don't know. Yeah. And I really believe in this. Do yeah. I, am I just going to go in the ICU and lay hands on you? Or I'm a surgeon. Like, do I just go in there and well, that thing is bleeding? Let me just energetically. No, fuck no. I get my fucking instruments and I use them. Come on. I mean, but, but the thing is to either, or it is just ridiculous. Like what planet do people live on that? I, you know what? They don't live on the same planet as me. I'm just going to say that. And what I've been doing work. So that, you know, that really motivated me when I, did my residency at Cedar sinai Medical Center, huge medical center, super famous, right? Like celebrities, but actually a big academic center too. Um, and it's a public private uh, consortium, right? So there's a lot of private docs and then there's the academic side. So it was kind of interesting. You really were seeing all of it. Yeah. And again, I just, I saw some of the uglier sides of medicine too. I learned everything. I had great and have great mentors and teachers, but also a lot of like very judgy, like I was, you know, it was the uh, mid nineties, right? I graduated, I started there at 90, in 96 and it was the era of people starting to advocate for themselves, women, especially on labor and delivery. And it was the eye rolly. If you came in with a birth plan and a doula, forget it. You're going to, you're having a section. I mean, people were absolutely talking about you behind your back. It and is they were true. planning a, a section for you. Well, I mean, I'm just saying, you know, that, that was the attitude, like, yeah. like the attitude was if yeah. a woman comes in empowered, How dare she, what, yeah, the, I, you know, when I say it out loud now, really all we were saying was, um, no, we're going to take that power back from you. I'm sorry. People don't want to hear this. This is true. This the advocacy happens for a reason. People fight back when they are being oppressed. Like what do you think is going to happen? And to take a physiologic event and medicalize it so much. And that all these women, because mostly the people working on labor and delivery were internalizing this misogyny. Right. Crazy. And I got, and I got pregnant yep. on purpose. And mm -hmm. I, I knew that was the attitude over there. Okay. So I, here I am an OBGYN resident at a big medical center. And I took a Bradley class, which is like a old school, natural childbirth, like a little bit crazy, to be honest, because I said to myself, I am 31 years old. There's nothing wrong with me. Yeah. I'm just pregnant. Yeah. Like, I'm pretty sure I can do this. And I, I came in in labor and my doctor, who I really love and appreciate, was super old school, like did all these interventions that I didn't need, like without my permission, without my husband, who is my advocate, was like, um, Suzanne doesn't want this. Can we talk about that? Is there this emergency? Can we talk about that? Like, no, ignored me totally. I had a super fast birth. Everything was fine. It changed my life though, because I had a real, I had an experience of having my agency disrupted for no reason. Yeah. It was still awesome. My son will be 24 in October. It was one of the best days of my life. My two best days, my the birth of my two children, but it changed me. And I had a different perspective. I, I had been a patient in a system that didn't see me as a person. They were doing their best. They cared so deeply. I, the people who took care of me and who worked there then and now, I mean, you don't go into medicine because you don't love people. You are so, so, but you don't understand what the system has, what patriarchy has done to you over the course of your life and your career. Yeah. I'm telling this whole long story because this is influencing every piece of information that you yeah. get, Anne-Marie, when yeah. you are reading scientific papers, when you are talking to people online, when you are having disagreements with other menopause experts out there, mm -hmm. this influences us. And if we don't understand it and have some insight, we are not giving our best. So I can only tell you how it influenced me. When I came out, I had, I'd done a little bit of yoga here and there. I mean, as a resident and I had another kid, like I was a resident and with two small children, please, did I have time for any self-care? Yeah. I had a fucking exercise from- yeah. From the time I got into medical school till probably after, I'm serious. Like it yeah. was not. No, I can believe residency. It. Like it was like you did a you know call and post call, and I came home to kids, and it was like a rough, rough time. Um, but when I graduated, I had met a patient while I was a senior resident, chief resident, such an interesting woman. She had been, she was a super duper natural, raw vegan, this whole thing had huge fibroids and she tried everything and then none of that stuff worked and she needed surgery. So she came into the clinic. I didn't know her. I met her in the, 
pre-op area. She was my junior residence patient. She didn't know me from, you know, a hole in the wall, right? And I'm going to do surgery on her. I went in there, introduced myself. She said to me, hey, I've got this essential oil. I th it will give you clarity in the operating room. Can you, can you put it on? And I was like, sure. Why not? I mean, I was like, what the fuck? But it's going to help you. You don't even know me and you're letting right. me cut you open. But a big deal. I'll do it. <laughs> and it was a crazy, I mean, to this day, I remember the surgery. It was in fucking tense. And her recovery was unreal. She had essential oils. Her friends made her food. She had Tibetan prayer flags in the room. She was out and about and out of that hospital so fast. She was so healthy. And she reached out to me later to thank me and say, look, what you don't know is that right before you came in, your attending physician, who was a lovely man, but like Southern, very, you know, you know, came in, I did the same thing and he balked. Oh. And then you came in and you were like, sure. And she's like, that kindness really meant a lot to me. Yeah. And I'm a meditation instructor and a Pilates instructor and a yoga teacher. And I'd love to offer you some classes to thank you. And I was like, you know, it's, thank you. You're a patient, blah, blah, blah. I really appreciate you. I, I learned a lot. I'm glad you're well. No, thanks. Kept her phone number. A year later after I graduated, I was cleaning out the room actually that had been our, our, was going to be my new baby's bedroom. And I found it and I was like, I'm not a resident anymore. I'm going to call her. I was, it said graduated the program and she introduced me to Ayurveda. Oh, wow. She was like, Ayurveda. She was funny. We're still friends. She said, it's not really for me, but I think it's for you. And at the time, Deepak Chopra had his center in La Costa and he was still medical director there and still teaching. And his, actually his medical director was this amazing man, David Simon, who is a neurologist, very academic uh, professor at UC San Diego and an Ayurvedic practitioner. And I went down there and I learned with them and I was like, oh my God. And I was really just doing it for my own interest. I was like, I was interested in the energy. I was interested in meditation and yoga and how to calm my own self down. Right. And it just grew from there. I wasn't like, I'm going to go be an Ayurvedic practitioner, but it, it was very affirming. And I, the course that they ran, and I think they still do it, was for healthcare professionals because they rightly understood we're only going to want to learn from other physicians. I'd been to some yoga studio talks and I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who the fuck are you? Yeah. Like you don't understand my brain or my world. You know, Deepak had surrendered his license voluntarily because he didn't want to practice anymore, but he's a for real endocrinologist, fellowship trained, brilliant man who is a brilliant physician. And so is David Simon. And there's nothing to sneeze out there. These guys are not shysters. I'm sorry. I don't believe that they're not well there's always you always have to say that don't you when it has something to do with the eastern world you always have to like point out and to well, also these oh, these, traditions, these traditions and these cultures have existed for thousands of years and you know a lot of our western medicine is based on ancient traditional stuff they ayurveda specifically is so interesting they have a whole other language and it's similar to chinese medicine they grew up around the same time five six thousand years ago um, first of all, Chinese medicine in my country is totally regulated. You have to be licensed. They go to serious, their training is very serious. It's on a par with medical school. Like they go to school for four years. They do a lot of them do fellowship or residencies. They get doctorates. Like it's not nothing to sneeze at. It's so to say study. it's been, studied. yes, it's been people it, it, there's, there's plenty of data on it. Plenty and of data. Very, yes. It's, there's a lot, even Ayurveda, there's a lot of, um, really interesting, like they have their own anatomical system, which is fascinating to me that they could understand how the body works without the same kind of sophisticated techniques that we think we have to understand uh, yeah. physiology. And they're highly accurate, highly accurate. They didn't have a way to measure electro, you know, electrical impulses, but right. It's energetic, right? Yeah. But they are accurate. Those, those anatomic descriptions are really, really accurate. Their focus on the gut microbiome, essentially, way, um, hello, turns out they're right. <laughs> right. So I don't get this whole, oh, we've been doing it for 20 years or we've been doing it for 70 years. We really got this. Like, what are you, yeah. no, please no, stop it. Yeah. So we have got certain things. We have definitely got certain things. We do not have it all. And the arrogance is what, the arrogance and the closed mindedness is what drove me to integrate. So I feel like I want to use what works best. You know, the truth is I mostly do well care and menopause, of course, is an extension of that. Menopause is well care. Yeah. There's not, not something wrong with you. You may not feel great. So that's, you know, we're going to try and work on that, but it's well care. So it's Can easier I just stop for you me. for one second? Cause I love that yeah. you're saying that, but yeah. you know, there's a huge 
movement. I don't know what you call it. Estrogen deficiency. I interviewed her yeah. last week. She said, Anne Marie, you are an ovarian failure. And I'm like, <laughs> it is a very, I mean, I'm no doctor. I don't feel like it's ovarian failure. I feel like it was meant to happen. Like I'm just, well, you're right. saying healthcare and I'm seeing like yeah, polar yeah. opposites. Like you, yeah. what you just yeah. said couldn't be further from the truth from what she said. I know. And that's how a lot of people see oh. it. And I think people who are out there doing like hormone balancing and stuff like that, like, which is just a word that doesn't even mean anything. Um, but I, but I understand where they're coming from. I think if you're 32, yeah. And you're, we're not talking about that, that it, your, your body, your body was programmed to do that. But in general, um, and this gets into the philosophical stuff too, right? Because this idea of norms and, you know, this is all very colonizer stuff. It really is like that. It's supposed to be a certain way. I would rather look at it this way. Now it is true medically as your ovaries function decline, which is the way I see it physiologically. And I'm talking about women in our age group. Um, there are downstream effects health wise. Yeah. So I think it's important to address those well in advance, which is one of the big reasons that I'm out here talking about menopause. I actually want us to do well, but I want our younger cohorts to know about this before they get there rather than like us getting sidelined. But I think to call it ovarian failure, that's like, you know, the old saying, when you have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Like, you know, I'm just guessing that this person is a person who does a lot of um, hormone stuff and testing and replacing. And, you know, there are people out there that I really appreciate and like, because in the integrative world, the wellness world is just like, now that's a bad word. Um, there's a really wide variety. We don't all have the same opinions. I mean, I think that my opinions are probably out of step with a lot of my colleagues. And I, I work with a doctor who I think is a genius and that's more her thing. Like she does do saliva testing and all this stuff. And, and I work with her because I learned with her and she's an outstanding teacher. And I felt I'm a breast cancer survivor. So I, there's a lot of hormones that I can't use and I won't use, but I also wanted to understand longer term, what my risks might be, what's the best way for me to support myself. And she's super smart, you know, and she's great. Cause she doesn't like, I'm not that person who wants to be aggressively rehormoned. You know, I can't, yeah. and yeah. she doesn't get my, she's not up my butt about it either. Right. Like <laughs> yeah. she's listen, she's out there wearing a continuous glucose monitor. And I'm like, what in the hell? Wow. I have a whole thing about that, but, but she has her reasons. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like she's, we should have talked about it. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. You know, yeah. like I draw so, the line that too. I, I don't know, but I I've feel started... like that gets into fat phobia and a lot of other yeah, stuff. Like, I mean, she, I... Yeah, her she has a family member who died young of diabetes and heart disease and stuff, and so she has other reasons. Like she has different risk factors. So I I get where she's coming from on that. And again, she's not pushy, trying to one size fits all it. But I think that's such an aggressive thing to say. Ovarian failure. I mean, just that word. Like you failed, or your body failed you. I mean, yeah. But this is a. I mean, this is a narrative really coming out of the UK. It's also in the US, but it's it's the narrative in the UK. It really is. And they're, they're ahead oh, of the world. They're ahead of the world in awareness. They have this menopause revolution going on. I know. I didn't realize um, that that was the background to their menopause the revolution. The background is estrogen deficiency. The main, you know, um, the leader there is Dr. Louise Newsom. She's, she's awesome. She's changed many people's lives, but she will say estrogen deficiency in every interview, every time she writes. And then this doctor is a just sort of a disciple of hers or a student of hers. And she- right. And it's just something that me sitting here in Abu Dhabi, I really noticed. And it's just, I think words are important, right? And it's, yeah. You know, so what's your approach now that you've, you know, you've got the Ayurvedic, you're sitting in this integrative seat. Um, I don't know whether to ask you about hormone therapy or just the whole. The you whole can ask thing. me anything. Well, so here's the thing. And as, and as I'm talking to you, like I'm realizing, you know, my own perspective is also like, my own perspective is my own perspective. Like I just told you this whole story about how I got where I am, which is hundred percent where I came from. And I think other people are also, that's what's going on with them too. So I think we need to unwind some of those stories for our own selves to understand what we, how we practice, because that affects other people, how we talk yeah. and how we take care of ourselves as just a person on the street 
who is going through menopause. That's really, really important to acknowledge. So you got to understand that I always was like super curious about other ways of doing things. And as I get older, I see that a lot of my approach was like, but wait, isn't this normal? Because I specifically chose OBGYN knowing like, the truth is like, I'm good in an emergency, but I don't really want to deal with sickness. (laughs) not really my jam. Yeah. I don't want your chronic kidney disease. Like yeah. that does not do it for me. It stresses me out. I'm never going to fix it. I know myself. I want to fix shit yeah. or I want it to be like, let's move through it. Like next yeah. I have ADHD. I don't want to do that. So I specifically chose what I perceived to be mostly well woman care or well person with the vagina care. Right. I don't see it as a disease. A okay. lot of what to us is not disease. It's so I don't see it that way. Now add into that. I had the Ayurveda, right? So I was also, I had a holistic perspective on, um, how we integrate with our own bodies, how all of these parts of our body integrate with themselves, mind, gut, your spirit, the environment, where you live, the season, this is appealing to me. I'm a context person. I'm a connection person. That's my thing. I mean, so I met you, mm-hmm. um, so I acknowledge like, this is how I am now on, add on top of it. I had, I had a, I had breast cancer in my forties. So that was it. I remember being, as I was in my forties, I was like, I, you know, I wonder if I'm going to practice what I preach and just do like herbal medicine and be natural when I get there. And then that, that question was answered for me. I can't use hormones. Okay. I can use vaginal hormones and I do, but I can't use systemic hormones. And I got to tell you in the last couple of years, I don't wish it, but I'm like, oh Jesus, I totally would have taken hormones well, for okay. sure. Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, because I, you know, I've had a lot of things that are really hard, but I, I know I would have felt better with hormones. I can't take them. So that motivated me even further to do a deeper dive. Not everybody can take hormones. Not everybody wants to take hormones. And we owe it to those people to have better solutions. To say you have ovarian failure. Yeah. And this is the way to do it. I mean, really? Because there isn't one way to do it. To me, as a journalist, I see messaging. To me, currently, I see messaging. That's to me a marketing, and it's mm-hmm. not just me. Like other, you know, Jerry Lynn Pryor is an endocrinologist in the um, uh, in Canada, American, and she's written. She wrote a piece in Scientific American saying it was a. It, it's a marketing term. It's not really a technically true term, although it is. But you know, which one, the menopause or or uh, ovarian estrogen good. deficiency? Estrogen yeah. deficiency yeah. is a term yeah. to describe yeah. what's going yeah. on. Yeah. And to me, when you know, I've covered health for a long time, and I know, you know, I know messaging when I see it. It to me, it is a marketing. T- it, like to me, it's not that it's it's not that or and to call it that is not that hormone therapy doesn't help, right? Like because we live in this kind of world where right. it's either thing, or. Like, yeah, like you, I mean, you know how hard it is to navigate all this stuff, but so. I guess what I'm saying is like, do you see this? Do you see this? Do you? Oh, yeah. How do you feel? yeah. Yeah, I do. And I see people out there, you know, it's more obvious, I think in the United States, because we are in a market-based system, a thousand percent. Yeah. <clears throat> like our healthcare system does not exist. There's no system. And so, you know, it becomes, and I will say this, my colleagues who I think are out there doing stuff that requires a lot of their time, a lot of their knowledge, um, they should be paid. They should be compensated. They shouldn't be getting $75 to sit with you for an hour and a half and really dig in in a way that no doctor has. It's not, I don't think it's fair, but the thing is it is a cash-based business. So a couple things happen there. They're going to be motivated by that to some extent. I, I, like I said, I think there's a lot of docs out there that really believe in what they're doing. And I think they're really smart. I think they're taking the science, they're pushing it further they're thinking outside the box, which is we are not encouraged to do in medicine at all, but you cannot, but what happens is the finger gets pointed at them. You're cash-based, you're motivated by money only. It's predatory. And then of course, there's a huge number of women to whom this is there. There's no access. You can't, I mean, they can't don't even have, have access to insurance-based yeah. care, which is yeah. shitty. So, so it, it's very easy to paint with a broad brush from either side, right? For them to also look at the docs that are working within the system, don't have the same kind of tools, don't have the same kind of training, don't have the same kind of support and be like, your doctor doesn't know anything about menopause because they don't. Um, and they're just uh, either blowing you off, which they do uh, as part of being a woman, keeping you on birth control pills, not a solution, um, or, you know, giving you the two things that might be covered by your insurance, you know? So there's a problem here because we, we're so, the opportunities are so 
disparate and so disconnected that it's easy for people to just point the finger. I think what I have attempted to do is see both sides and then take the best of both worlds. I still work with an insurance-based system. I do have some telemed and some people that see me who who don't take, I don't take their insurance and I, they do get more of my time. Um, And then my, my ability to kind of teach on it and on these sort of social platforms, my startup, other stuff has allowed me to reach a wider, writing the book has allowed me to reach a wider audience because you're right. I am a unicorn. Yes. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I, I like, I'm owning it now. I used to be like, oh, that offends me for some reason. I don't know. I think I was just not owning how awesome I am or something, which is like, yeah, well, I need to be, I need to own that more. If but you I, and I, every other woman that hits this age is like, wait, the thing about me that makes uh, me weird is, but I think um, basically I want to ask you also, we're different, right? Right, like, right. So when I'm right. in your office, like part of this thing of the marketing term is I feel like there's this hormone therapy for everyone. I'll fix you. That is another message that seems to be out there. Why aren't you on hormone, hormone therapy? Because I'm not, because here I can't really get it. I'm scared of going on it and not being able to get it, but we're all different. So a woman walks in your office, how do you approach her? And she's got all the symptoms that you've had. What's right. How do you proceed? Well, if, you know, the book talks a lot about this because the book does this sort of uh, c- context, my, my perspective, it does sort of definitions because I, people come in completely lacking knowledge of what is really what the language is. And then um, I do give people tips and tools for how to approach their, their mm-hmm. um, care around this and how to approach uh, any clinician that they might work with. And, you know, the actual, the, the biggest thing that I really try to identify is just goal setting. What's going on with you and what are your priorities? Because you nailed it. This is exactly right. This is when I say one size, it's not one size fits all. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Like for you, your, your lack of sleep may really be the biggest issue for you. And I will, t- uh, spoiler alert, it's everybody's biggest issue, whether or not they realize it, because it is fucking everything up. Right. And so now is your lack of sleep from hot flashes? Is your lack of sleep from, you've had insomnia your whole life and now it's worse? Is it because you're waking up to pee? Like, so we start diving in and then I can identify, okay, what are the couple of things that we can do at this first visit? You know, is it your hot flashes during the day and it's disrupting your personal life, your professional life? Is it your dry vagina? You can't exercise or have sex the way you want. Like, what is the big issue for you? Because everybody does not have the same thing. There's sure there's, you know, the 34 symptoms, whatever, what is this stuff, you know, but I mean, there's kind of like a top five that I see. Um, and the other spoiler alert, diving in, writing this book and really studying and talking to people, this, the weight thing is a huge, huge, huge issue for people. It has been for me too. And I'm going to say some things people don't want to hear because there isn't a silver bullet. There isn't. I mean, that's the short answer. That's a much longer answer, but the book is about is like, how do I approach this? And then how can you take this to approach it yourself? It grew, this thing grew out of not only my practice, but I started because when I would give a talk about anything, um, everybody would actually wanted to ask me about bioidentical hormones. Right. And I'd be like, Whoa, I can't like, that is like a 10 hour lecture. And I kept thinking like how, like, people aren't getting the information. They're getting confused. They don't understand even what these terms mean. A friend of mine um, invited me to a women's workspace, right? This is like three years ago, probably maybe longer. I don't remember to give a talk on menopause. And it was seen as a very, she's a millennial. She's now in her mid thirties, right? Um, It was a very millennial thing. And I was like, really, you want me to come talk about menopause? Okay. And it basically, I had a moment in the talk and I was like, oh, because we've lost the intergenerational conversation. So you guys don't know what's coming next. And this, that group of women specifically is very looking forward, wants to know, wants the information, wants to have decision-making power, understands these relationships in a very different way than we do. And it really, I said to myself, okay, I need to do, I just, I need to do this. I need to create. And I just and came into my brain menopause boot camp. So I started doing them and I had four hours of content and it was really explaining, answering questions. What is your issue? My, my partner is a 35 year fitness pro and a former professional, actually is a current professional bodybuilder is not competing, but he has. Um, and so he really understands physiology, fitness, eating all of it. And he does a portion and that's where it came from. So I had been working one-on-one with women forever. 
then I had these groups and I really saw what happened in the group dynamic. And, and then the piece of like wanting to help people move into the stage without fear and anxiety. So it's not going to be the same. What you walk in with is not necessarily the same as what I walk in with, you know, or you have a family history that concerns you or a personal history. Maybe there's all and all the women in your family. Maybe you have heart disease. Maybe you had cancer. Like there's no way every single, so what are we saying? Are we saying if you have all these, these other things, you can't do hormones and we have nothing for you. Cause these herbs, there's only, you know, a thousand people in the study, or there's only 171 people in the study. Oh, herbs. They're just trying to take your money. Um, so I was just supposed to suffer. What, what I don't count. There's a lot of us. Yeah. Like that's also bullshit. Yeah. And mean, it's also mean. <laughs> Yeah. I heard, I heard, saw a lady on Instagram and she wrote, Oh, at least you, something about, at least you shouldn't go to an integrative physician who prescribes you hundreds of supplements and charges you thousands of dollars. Like it was the most crazy thing I'd ever seen because it's like, is that what you think they do? Like, I don't know what you're talking about. That's what Um, they've been told. Yes. Yes. So hormone therapy, people always say, I'll ask like TikTok and say, well, I'm talking to a doctor. What should I ask? Always. Should I take hormone therapy? Is it safe? And, and then everyone brings up the woman's, you know, health. Right. Diet. Right. Right. But, um, right. What do you, yeah. What 2021, September, 2020, 2021. Where are we at? I mean, the quick and dirty is that that study was both like the, I mean, it changed everything. The way I describe it is like the record scratch at the, at the rave, <laughs> you know, everybody's like yeah. jamming well, out. Yeah. And, yeah. 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 Whoops. Um, it's a horrible study, but it's a great study because there's a billion people in it. There's a lot of power. They did it really badly, <laughs> but they also got some really interesting information. And guess what? It made every, it made a lot of the menopause revolution possible because I do think that what happened is people had to start looking at alternatives, start looking at the data differently, start looking at women differently, start looking at women, start yeah. paying attention. And yes, some cuckoo ball shit came out. But then the conventional people were like, well, these cuckoo balls are doing something. We better pay attention to them. Like it's a really interesting moment. The Women's Health Initiative to take that data and be like menopause hormone therapy, because now we call it MHT Mm -hmm. is because we keep changing the names, whatever um, is bad is no, that's not correct. So hormone replacement therapy, whatever you want to call it in general is pretty safe for the right person. But it also depends on what you're doing, how you're doing it, how you're consuming it. Are you giving it through the skin, which is my preference? Are you taking it orally? Um, how, how much are your liver enzymes being activated? Do you have a propensity yourself toward heart disease, strokes, blood clots? Okay, estrogen's not for you. You know, it's a little more complicated than that. Again, speaking to every person is not the same. Um, vaginal hormone replacement therapy, my absolute favorite, because pretty much anybody and I mean, anybody, I'm a breast cancer survivor with an estrogen receptor, positive tumor. I use it. Okay. The data is very clear. It is not absorbed into your entire body. Mm-hmm. It's just treating the vaginal, the vulva, that tissue. And the, it's not just for sex. So for people who don't want to be sexual or that's not interesting, it's also for your genital urinary system. You know, people get, people have all sorts of issues with bladder ish, you know, bladder discomfort, UTIs. Yep. Uh, vaginal infections, you know, there's other reasons to do it. It's just a discomfort. So I think hormones for many of us in some way are, are safe and effective, really effective. I mean, the single most effective thing you can do for hot flushes is take estrogen. So if you can take estrogen, I mean, do it. If the hot flushes are that bad, do it. The brain stuff I think is going to be really interesting and we're not going to get all the research, but there's so much compelling data pointing toward estrogen deficiency as, as really one of the biggest players for the development of dementia and Alzheimer's. It's not the only thing, yeah. you know, but you know, women in midlife and beyond have two to three times the rate of dementia and Alzheimer's as men. Yeah. Now, we also look, you know, they call Alzheimer's diabetes type three, right? So it's not that simple. It's also, it's inflammatory, Mm -hmm. but estrogen is a, as a anti-inflammatory molecule. This is why people get joint pain, frozen shoulder, you know, this stuff is real. Yeah. You have them all through your body. So it's like anything goes what I'm learning. Yeah. Um, So that's interesting. Like it's the big three that I'm hearing as a person who is not on it yet. 
It's, yeah. It, I feel like the message is like, you're putting yourself at bigger risk for the big three, like osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease, and dementia sure. if yes. you're not on it. And so that is, yeah. I think that's another question that I get from social media all the time is like, should I be on it for later as a preventative? I think for osteoporosis, the data is the most clear and it absolutely decreases risk. Here's the thing, heart disease, you know, this is one of the things that I was taught in residency. And then that was just thrown out the window um, in with the women's health initiative, but it's not that simple either because of course, estrogen itself can be inflammatory and increase blood clotting, but it is anti-inflammatory in, in other ways. So the endothelium, the lining of the vessels, which is really where women's heart disease is. Women's heart disease is different than men's heart disease. Women's heart disease tends to be microvascular in the small vessels and not as much the big events and the big clots. I mean, obviously women have strokes, yeah. but, but these smaller vessels are the issue. So, and again, we don't have enough issue en enough information. I have an amazing colleague, uh, Dr. Suzanne Steinbaum, who is a, a, a preventive cardiologist. And she and I've talked a lot about this and I think the story is not yet told. So it's, it's just not clear, but I think for someone who is low risk, otherwise symptomatic and concerned about optimizing their aging, I think it's a great thing to do. And I see every kind of person coming through my office. I see that person all day, every day, and not all of them want to do the same thing. Mm. Some of them are people who don't take Tylenol and they don't want to take medicine mm -hmm. and it is medicine and that's fine. Yeah. They don't have to do that. Cause here's the other thing, you know, humans have existed on this planet for a very long time. And we didn't start doing menopausal hormone therapy until sometime in the last century, right? And even though there's this idea that, oh, everybody, women all died in childbirth and da, 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 da. Yeah. It's, it's not really true. I mean, yeah, we, more of us died in childbirth than we did now, but um, depending on where you, who you are, of course, but there's all sorts of interesting like, evolutionary biology stuff about like the grandmother effect. And this is real. Like there are certain women who always lived past childbearing and they were a very important part of the culture, a very important part of survival of their particular family and their gene pool. So it's the story isn't, it's just not black and white. And there are other things you can do there. Here's, you know, the, but the number one thing you can do for all of it, guess what? What? exercise <laughs> fucking move oh, your ass move your ass and that will help it all yeah it's and it every, really does that's well, the makes, most important thing you can do you're gonna you're gonna weight bearing on your bones mm -hmm. blood flow to your brain super important blood flow to your whole body blood flow to your heart uh, maybe your bmi who cares about your bmi that's some bullshit that's some actuary stuff it's not even medical you, you know what i'm annoyed right now i'm carrying this blub ugh, that I'm not excited about, but I exercise so hard yeah. <laughs> and I do it consistently. And I know, first of all, I feel awesome. It's great for your brain in terms of your mind, you know, how you feel. And I know that it is the single most important thing I can do for every single potential medical issue I might develop. So I can't do hormones, but I can exercise. Okay. The single most important thing. And thousand percent. Diet, is that the second single most important thing you can do? Absolutely. I guess they go together. Yeah, but I also be careful about diet, right? I mean, I know I know what you mean. Like, yeah, like this is what I try to tell my, my people, right? You know, 70 to 80% of the time you should be eating the stuff that you know you should be eating. We should be more plant-based. I don't think you have to be a vegan. I mean, the vegans definitely, the, some vegans definitely have, have some great data, right? I mean, plants are just healthier for us. I and mean, what do you think the animals are eating for God's sake? Um, you know, so it's not true that you can't build protein. A cow is a vegan. So stop it. You know, it doesn't <laughs> make sense. Okay. I mean, a real cow is a vegan. Um, but I think leaning more toward plants, you know, all the stuff people know, staying away from processed food, but that doesn't mean I love my cocktail. I like, you know, I, you know, love to, and I love ice cream and I'm not, yeah. I'm not having it every day. Yeah. Um, and I, I need to, watch what I might do because I'm trying to stay healthy, you know? Yeah. Um, but yes, of course, what you consume is very important. You can't exercise away a bad diet. Can't do that. Listen, not, not at our age, not at our age. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, do I ever feel it when I don't eat well, it's, it's like immediate. Um, 
So just to go to go to hormone therapy, I'm curious about um, testosterone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Testosterone. I do sometimes. I do. It's not my first thing. Um, and again, I don't do so. People who are testing hormones and treating based on that there's not really good data to support it. I'm not saying there's no place for it at all because sometimes it, there is a place for it once you're sort of in the weeds and like doing more and trying to figure things out. But we don't even, we don't, and, and that's not because like it doesn't exist. Let me just, I want to be really clear about this. We don't have the data. That's the problem because nobody's looked at it because it's complicated. Women are complicated. So to have to look at like diurnal variation and cyclic variation. And it, that would be really hard to do, which is a big excuse for why we haven't really looked at women's health. It's some bullshit. And I knew, I know people out there who are starting to really look at that and, and dive in. And that is very important. But the truth is we don't have reference ranges. Like this is where you need to be. Now the testosterone data is interesting because more and more we do have compelling data that shows specifically with sexual function, the testosterone does play a role. That doesn't mean that's going to be the first thing I throw at you. Okay. If you're coming in with like the classic perimenopause, menopause pictures, but I will say that for some people, some testosterone for sure, it'll be helpful with vaginal health because much like estrogen, it does help with the tissue integrity, blood flow, collagen production, elasticity, all of that. Um, you know, all the things that make all those things work. Um, there, I would love to see more compelling data on like energy um, and fatigue. So that's another big issue right. that we see uh, and muscle mass. But I mean, if you like, if you look at bodybuilding, I mean, those are like super physiologic levels that they use. Like, of course, yes. And would you feel amazing? This is what I tell people who get pellets and stuff. Of course you felt amazing. You had a crazy high testosterone level, yeah. which over time is going to cause other problems for you. Like just because you feel great doesn't mean it is good for you. Right. Like something you take, there's always a reaction, right? Like when you add something in, there's usually you're going to, you know, it, what goes around comes around, even in your body. Yeah. I mean, you're going to have issues, superficial issues, acne, um, potentially hair growth, but heart issues you can have. Right. Um, you can, I mean, even testosterone use in the genital area or, or systemically, you can have changes to the genitals that are not good. And that could be permanent. Like, I mean, mostly like clitoral enlargement. I mean, this is like very high levels of, of, uh, testosterone, but you know, there's, there's bad things too. There's a good and a bad to everything. So I think testosterone needs more info, but I think it's interesting. And I think it is useful for a lot of people. I think, I think a lower dose of and this is where I use compounding, right? Because we don't have testosterone that's FDA approved for women in very many forms. And most of us aren't going to inject it. That's mm -hmm. craziness. So this is where the whole compounding thing becomes a thing too. I'm like, it's really not fair. I mean, if I can find FDA approved uh, hormones that that's always where I start, that's where I'm going to do it. But if, and if that's working for you, awesome. But if I can't, and I feel like that's going to be helpful, then we are going to go to compound it. So a lot of times I'll compound my estrogen. So estradiol and estriol with some testosterone for vaginal use, um, or for, um, so as a cream usually, uh, or for systemic, I don't tend to use it systemically as much. I just don't, like I said, I don't feel like we, we need more data. So you're basically, when you say that you're talking about bioidenticals that are yes. created in a compounding pharmacy, right? you're you're creating like a little cocktail for, say I come in, you're creating like, okay, Amory, I think you need some estrogen in your vagina and a little bit of testosterone. And we're going to give this a whirl. Right. Um, and you're, and you're OBGYN, OBGYN and you're doing this and, yeah. but the, you know, these compounding pharmacies, I've said this before, like they, some corners treat them like they're like some sort of meth lab or something like, I know, <laughs> I know is another, I don't know if this is a pharmaceutical industry, uh, tactic. Well, or I, I think it's, I think it's a little of both. I think some of it is a safety issue because they're regulated differently. Right. right. And, and so you could be less regulated and be practicing with integrity. I mean, pharmacists have really serious training. Yeah. Frankly, there's harder than doctors. I would never, I barely passed pharmacology. I mean, I was just like, fuck, no, what is that? I'm just going to have to like regurgitate something and hope that it stays in my yeah. brain long enough to get through this exam. Yeah, <laughs> so they're very, hard. Yeah. 
They're very smart. Yeah. So, so there, so I think it's a matter of knowing your compounding pharmacist. I happen to work in a large city. I'm very, like, I, it's a unique situation. And I know the pharmacists. I know what's going on in those pharmacies. I've been there. I've seen their practices. And there's a certain, there's a level of trust, which, I mean, I just have to also, you know, have some faith, right? That this human being is not just a horrible person, you know, and there have been problems with practices that were not only harmful, killed people. I mean, it was a small number of people, but if you look at, I mean, I mean, if you look at FDA approved drugs, killing people, that's also a thing that happens. So it's just kind of like, not funny. I'm just I think it's chair. No, but it's bullshit. Again, it's just cherry picking. It's like, yeah. let me find all the things that support my idea rather than let me get curious. Why do people hate compounding pharmacies? Like, what's that about? Like, right. so, I mean, I just made the decision to sort of learn about it and, and find practitioners that I trust. And that's what I do. I don't, and it's not my, it's not my, my first line therapy either. Okay. It's what you do when you, you have to be a bit nimble. Right. But aren't the hormones that you are using the FDA approved hormones, aren't they same in some cases? Just yes, yes, yes. So this is the other thing too, this whole bioidentical people objecting to the word bioidentical. I mean, it's just like a description. The fact is that, and this is the thing that I have to tell patients all the time who, you know, a lot of times they are refugees from some fancy, ridiculous $7,000, you know, half a day experience. And, and they're very disappointed or they got the, the pellets and they're like, I have a hole in my ass now. And I'm like, yeah, it's kind of sucks. Sorry. You know, so then they come to me and I have to explain to them, okay, hold on. So FDA approved bio, bioidentical just means it's biologically identical to what your body was making essentially. Right. Um, the FDA has many approved. There are a lot of drugs out there that are commercially available. You can get at CVS that are FDA approved. They're like, what? They, natural. They think everything natural. What is natural? It's not natural. Natural is I kill you and eat your ovary. That's what's natural to you and me, your ovary. Well, I'm not going to do that. And neither are you. So <laughs> what are you talking about? It's not a yam, a yam that you get progesterone from. I mean, sometimes that is a source. That's not natural to you. I mean, yes, it's a, a yeah. big brew in the ground, but I mean, people's like the definitions are, that's where people get really confused and they do get manipulated. Yeah. But in the UK, okay. In the UK, they call it body identical. Did they call it that in the US? No. no. What do they call it? What do they call it? Bio, bio, oh, they just, well, they don't. I don't think people distinguish it. I do that because I, I know my audience. <laughs> So, you know, and I feel like, I feel like that, that, that term describes what it is and it helps people understand. I am not, I don't call things natural. I mean, natural, that's just like, what does that even mean? Yeah. Right. I, you know, so, um, that's the term I use. And I know there are a lot of my colleagues are like, Oh, I don't use that term. It's a marketing term. And I'm like, okay, I, I hear you, but I'm also trying to speak the language that my patients and clients and people I educate are using so that we can understand each other. It's a term. People use it, you know, yeah. it's okay. It's just a word. Yeah. It's just a word to, to just a little bit about pellets, because this seems to be a huge raging debate and, uh, I don't really understand it. These pellets well, are they implant into your. Yeah. And then it's like, okay, good luck. <laughs> like they're in there for, until they disappear. Right. And also, so the amount of, uh, that you are going to absorb is really variable. And again, we don't have safety data on this. And I have absolutely seen people coming in with bleeding, with problems. I mean, it can, you know, you overstimulate the lining of your uterus, you can cause hyperplasia or cancer. And I have absolutely seen that or terrible symptoms and there's nothing you can do. I mean, testosterone levels that are 10 times what they should be. And that doesn't feel so good. You know, it's just, I, I had a, I had a, a conversation with a patient earlier this week. And she, I mean, she really like the red flag went up. She went to a new integrative doc and this guy started wanting to try to sell her all the pellets. And he was really doing the hard sell. Like, well, I have time for you now, or you should definitely, what time do you want to come? When do you want to come? Because this is the, this is the only way to treat. And she was like, wow, I'm just going to call my gynecologist. Yeah. <laughs> but a lot of people would be like, okay, really? Because they're coming in afraid of aging, not feeling well, not being addressed. Yeah. And this person is offering a simple solution. Don't you think too, we're, we're, 
we just don't want to have to go through like coming to you and then coming back to you and coming like I know you just like just give me the thing that's going to fix it and so that appeals to that part of us that doesn't have time of course I to- I totally understand that I get it you know it's just I mean lifestyle fixes are not are not as appealing but they work better <laughs> okay so it is what about um what about progesterone because this is an interesting thing to me because it seems like as in the traditional medicine, it's estrogen. And then you only give progesterone to protect the lining of the uterus. If you right. have uterus. Right. And it's just sort of there and maybe it helps. Right. Sleep. But in the naturopathic world, the integrative world, there's people, they're saying, Hey, progesterone alone maybe works. Like, where do you stand on that? Because yeah, again, the data isn't so great there. And I, it's something that I feel like I want to learn more about because I, I, I actually end up using quite a bit of est- uh, progesterone alone in perimenopause okay. because what's happening is that as the ovary fails, <laughs> it actually doesn't make as much progesterone. This whole estrogen dominance, all these terms too, do come from more naturopathic and integrative. And so I know my conventional colleagues are like literally having a shit fit right now. If they're listening, they're not listening yeah. to this, <laughs> but anyways, they don't like it. So estrogen dominance, that's a little bit of a misnomer. It's not that you're making more estrogen. It's that you have less progesterone being produced in the second half of the cycle. So I find a lot of people's symptoms do start happening with that. It's complicated. The estrogen is also diminishing. So people are feeling that, but sometimes, especially um, in the second half of the cycle, people having mood issues or just feeling really off. It's really interesting how restoring that progesterone for some of my patients really does help. So I, I hear where they're coming from that, um, making this all, that's why I think calling it estrogen deficiency is kind of like, "Mm." but your ovary does makes a lot of things and not a lot of things. It really makes estrogen and progesterone and some testosterone, right? Uh, The, the adrenals are making testosterone too. Things are changing as we age. I think we need to understand more about progesterone. I mean, do I give progesterone to my patients who don't have a uterus? I usually don't. Sometimes I do very uncommonly. And we just, in the conventional literature, we just don't have a lot of information on it, but here's the thing about progesterone. And I'm talking about progesterone, not progestin, yep. progestin, bad for your breasts, bad for your breasts. Okay. There's, there's fairly decent data that prolonged progesterone and progestin may increase risk of breast cancer. Okay. So progesterone, I think can be helpful for some people. Okay. And then we just need the, to know more. The debate that rages, you know, I know Jen Gunter is like a dead, get, dead set against, um, I know progesterone cream, but I think maybe like, what, why is that? Is it because it doesn't really, if you can't use it to oppose and it's dangerous and people think you can't use it to oppose the estrogen. The p- progesterone cream is really erratically absorbed right. in some people. It will be absorbed enough. And I think if someone can't tolerate oral estrogen, I'm willing to do progesterone cream, but that is a person who is going to need more monitoring. Um, they're going to need to be coming in more. I need to look at the lining of their uterus. I, again, I will work with people. I will, I would talk, but is progesterone cream the way I do it? No, it is not. It is not because she, she's correct in that way. Yeah. It's just not absorbed as, as uniformly as oral. And so you it's can't guarantee. Right. It's also something you can get without a doctor. That's why I think some of the nerve wracking part of it for physicians is like, you can order it, I think on Amazon and it might be fake. 100%. You know, it might yeah. not even, there's a lot of, um, I don't know what's in you it. Call them. There's a lot of fake, uh, medications out there on, like, it's, I don't know who would bother making a fake progesterone cream, but people do. <laughs> well, I think again, if they're not regulated the same way, they aren't held to the same standard. And so, you know, maybe this batch isn't as good as the last batch, but again, in general, pr- progesterone cream in and of itself is not dangerous. So, I mean, it may not be protecting you, but it's not dangerous. So okay. whatever. Okay. Did you say you have ADHD? I mean, I'm not diagnosed, but okay. I think I it's pretty clear. Yeah. I think a lot <laughs> of people, <laughs> people do 17 things like you. And I also do a lot of things. I think we have a, I just think that's how our brains work, but I'm seeing a lot of ADHD diagnoses in women. And one of the questions I got on TikTok when I said I was interviewing you was, I want to know more the, the, about the link between it. Like, is the, is it, is there, do you know any? I don't know. Now I'm going to look at it. I don't know. I really don't know. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I I don't know about that. Okay. I think that that's a little bit more of a, not that ADHD isn't a real thing because it's, it's definitely real. Um, I have a a kid who has it, you know, pretty severely actually, but, um, 
I think some of it is also the expectation of us continuing to multitask in a way that is just not realistic mm. and being more fatigued, having some brain fog and over it. <laughs> like, I think there's a, some social con construct feeding into that. Again, not to take away from ADHD as a, as a, a an entity or as a diagnosis, but I find it interesting. I agree. And I think it's a little more complicated than that, that all of a sudden it's getting diagnosed. The other thing too, is that women's ADHD looks different. And so it's very possible that you would get through your whole life and you're behaving in class, which is, you know what I mean? Even though you're like spaced out and know what the hell's going on, but nobody noticed you, you weren't disruptive and your grades were like good enough. So then you kind of got, cause that's usually when it gets caught is when kids go to school. Cause they're like, ah, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, for me, I was to talk too much, but had really great grades and was not like super disruptive. I was a good kid. So like, I didn't get in trouble and it was the seventies, you know what I mean? Like nobody diagnosed it. So that's the other thing is that is like sort of misogyny baked into the educational system so that then people don't get diagnosed till later. Okay. I don't know. Um, any top advice for weight gain? I well, mean, like I said, <laughs> I mean, a lot of it is in the last two years also, I think it's impossible to say what's, you know, we know that chronic stress and cortisol release, you know, your body reads it as fight or flight. Like, oh my God, you're not going to eat again. You're stressed. You better, we better hold on to this weight. Like and insulin resistance increases. And then the more fat you deposit on your body, the more insulin you have, more insulin resistance you have. So, you know, we don't metabolize the same way inactivity, lack of sleep. So these are things. And then our metabolism starts to decline as we age, notwithstanding that huge new study that I think it's mm. flawed in a lot of ways, especially looking at women. It's just not true that women in perimenopause and menopause don't experience weight gain and metabolism slowing. It's not true. We lose lean body mass. We lose bone, we lose muscle and our metabolism slows. So that's why the fitness thing and the exercising is so, 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 so important, but also you're not going to get away with the same shit that you used to get away with, even at 40, mm -hmm. like you cut this out for uh, three weeks and you're good to go. And I think diet culture makes it worse. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think this whole like obsession with it's keto, it's no carbs. It's, I mean, people need all of the different macros to live. We don't all eat the same way. We don't all live the same way. And our body isn't all the same way. And here's what all my nutrition people that I've, and I've interviewed a lot of them, the really learned ones and all the data is very clear. A lot of this is genetically predisposed. Yeah. So, not you know, calories in, calories out. <laughs> it, ultimately it is. Yeah but you would have to really put yourself into a, a, a pretty big calorie deficit and that can slow your metabolism more. Women respond differently to fasting and things like that. And if you look, if you really look carefully at all intermittent fasting, all these different diets, it's calorie deficit. I mean, intermittent fasting works for a lot of people because you're eating less calories. Yeah. And I think if you look at the kind of carbs you're eating again, um, high fiber, you know, uh, more whole food based, lower glycemic index, those are probably going to be better, but there are people who can eat bread and stay skinny. And that's like a genetic thing. And there are people who can't eat bread because they can't even tolerate it. I can't digest it. So, like I said, that's kind of not the answer people want to hear, yeah. but if you can get the stress and the sleep under control, actually you will go a much longer way in maintaining your, your weight and your health. And you see a lot of women, what about dealing with your emotional stuff? How big of a yeah. piece of this do you think it is? It's very big. It's very big. I mean, it's a huge thing and it's, it's not some of it, you know, some of it is just the hormonal stuff. It really is. I've experienced it myself, you know, just like being sidelined by some like full body emotional experience that I cannot even link to anything. I'm like, what is going on? It started in my late thirties. <clears> who <throat> was not a person who had PMS. And all of a sudden it took me a while to figure out, oh, this is a PMS. Oh, okay. So at least I knew, oh, four days before my period, you know, like I could figure that out. I think, you know, and then like the rage or irritability thing that happens, like you just can't tolerate anything. It's, it's definitely hormonal and it's, it's rough. And I don't, do we understand why it happens? No. Some of it also is like what we talked about earlier. And you and I've had this conversation before, like just being over things and people just being like, I am 40 something, I am 50 something. And your ridiculousness is just yeah. not working for me anymore and not caring anymore and not, not deciding to behave and follow the, the script of the patriarchy anymore. And that's seen as, you know, moodiness, <laughs> right. which is some of it is like, no, the mood is that I don't really give a shit how you want me to do things. 
and right, I've been whatever. behaving for 45 years or 53 years. And I'm actually, why? It doesn't benefit any of us. Right. So I'm not going to behave anymore. Right. So it's complicated, but to that feeling of that is a real thing I've experienced. The other thing is the lack of sleep is so huge. Anybody who doesn't sleep, we know this from postpartum, postpartum depression and anxiety are far worse when people don't sleep. Okay. So if people can get, you know, a solid five hours, they're going to do much better. Okay. And that's in your thirties, right? I'm just, you know, I mean, obviously it could be postpartum at our age too, but in general, so you can imagine, like, we just don't have the same energy levels. And if we are not getting good sleep, our mood is just a mess. Yeah. You know, we're not, we're not able to tolerate things. We don't feel good. Yeah. Hey, what's been, uh, what's been a good thing about getting in your fifties and getting, getting a lot of things, a lot of things, like I said, like kind of paying less attention to what I think other people think. Cause it is what I think other people think. I mean, the truth is everybody is pretty much thinking about themselves. <laughs> if they're really thinking about you, they really probably should be thinking more about themselves. <laughs> like, they need to get a better hobby. <laughs> How boring is it? Your lane. Everyone needs to stay in their lane. Well, okay. Calm down. <laughs> you know that and creativity. Like because of that, I've been more more open to being creative and taking risks in a creative way, which has been amazing. Well, Very you're the epitome of a. I mean, it's not a second act, but you're, you've got a book coming out. You've got a startup. Well, it is. What's the startup? Yeah. Tell me just a little bit. about. Oh this. yeah. Yeah. The startup. So, I mean, I, I don't know when this will publish, but I've been chief medical officer of a sexual health startup called Lay Manu, um, founded here in Los Angeles and with two amazing partners who are super young and keep me on my toes because they know all sorts of things I don't know. Um, and we are working to create a holistic environment that supports, encourages, and treats sexual health at any age. It turns out that I'll, probably half our clientele are women 45 and above. And so we do have a menopause focus in some ways. And we're, we have a digital platform that is getting built out now. We have one brick and mortar place here in Los Angeles. We do a lot of online events, everything from referrals to sexual uh, therapists and public floor physical therapists to online communities, events, and then treatments in person. We'll be moving, we're moving more into now vaginal uh, hormone replacement um, and really helping people optimize that part of their being because it is very important and it, it is poorly understood, poorly studied. And um, another area of, of health that is sort of an orphan area, which it shouldn't be, you know, because we don't get the training or the, or the, the, the expertise, you know, yeah. there's all sorts of data. It's very similar to menopause. Like people come out of their, their residencies, not really knowing how to address these things. And, and people don't bring attention to it in the clinic because they're ashamed and embarrassed. And then if we're like, oh, you know, we, people get told, oh, have a glass of wine you know, that'll, you'll be fine. My vagina hurts. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't not matter what that works. It's not, when it hurts, yeah. everything's wrong, right? Everything's offside. Okay. Yeah. So, um, what's your book? What, what's the news with the book called and when it's coming out and where can people find you? Um, people can find me on my social channels. Ask, uh, Dr. Suzanne. I'm most, I'm mostly on, uh, on Instagram. I just, I can't deal with Twitter that much and Facebook. And I, I'm trying to do TikTok, but we'll see how that works. Okay. And my book is called the menopause Boot Camp, So it's based on the events. Um, and it's going to be published by Harper Collins sometime in 2022, probably the first quarter. The interesting thing about the pandemic is that everybody, all of a sudden there were a ton of books. <laughs> so my publisher is very backed up, but she's got the manuscript. And the cool thing about it is that if you read the book, there's also kind of a template so that you can create your own menopause boot camps that fits your community, your friends, um, you, however you want to do it. Because I really see this as a movement of people taking this information and, and molding it to their experience and what they want to do with it. And um, the community aspects of it are so powerful. These conversations are really everything. This is how we regain a sense of ourselves and the information and, and share with each other. Because a lot of what happens is isolation and shame and fear. And when we're talking about it and we're sharing, it's, it's, you realize you're not the only one going through this and, and, oh, she did that. Maybe I should try this. Or, you know, oh, you talked to that doctor or that was your trainer. Oh, cool. You know, like it's just, it grows. Yeah. People stop being afraid to say the word. 
Oh yeah. Come on. When you talk about it, you, it doesn't matter anymore. I say it all the time. And we're making like women's circles, you know, like little women's circles all over. Well, thank you so much. I could talk to you. You're so interesting. And it's, it's so great to talk to you, but thank you. Always. Thank you, uh, thank you for your time. And um, I love, I love talking to you and what you're doing. Thank you for what you're doing, helping people understand themselves better. Really, really appreciate it. I look forward to the next conversation. Me too. Thanks.